We're almost done with shock, but there is one more type of shock we need to speak about, and that is distributive shock. With distributive shock, we have a loss of arterial and venous tone, and what that leads to is a pooling of blood into the venous space and a decrease in perfusion pressure in the arterial tone. So going back to our model, our pipes are decreased, and as a result, the pump, the cardiac output, the heart rate, the stroke volume, they increase, and the tank increases because the kidneys are trying to hold on to water and salts and increase the intravascular space. So let's talk about the different types of distributive shock. The first one is neurogenic shock. This happens whenever there's a break in the cervical thoracic chain of the sympathetic system or the sympathetic chain. And this sympathetic chain provides sympathetic output to the body. This is what increases the heart rate and this is what increases the blood pressure. So what happens is when you have a break in the cervical thoracic chain, we have a baseline bradycardia and hypotension. And when you see bradycardia and hypotension, you have to think about neurogenic shock because whenever you have hypotension, there is a reflex in heart rate and increase in cardiac output. But when you have the two of these together, you have to think this is a neurogenic form of shock. This can happen from penetrating or blunt trauma, typically with injury to the cervical cord, but this can happen with anything that breaks up the chain. It can happen with autoimmune diseases, it can happen with tumors, anything that breaks that cervical thoracic chain. The second type of distributive shock we can have is adrenal crisis. The adrenals provide the hormone that provides sympathetic outflow. These are things like cortisol, mineralocorticoid, and of course, epinephrine. When you have a patient who is chronically on steroids and then they have an abrupt withdrawal of that steroid, or they have an acute shock state or stress state, the adrenals can go into crisis and decrease output. And this leads to a vasoplegic or distributive type of shock. The third type of distributive shock is anaphylaxis. This is such an important thing that we'll do a separate crit pits just on this one. But anytime you have a patient who is exposed to an allergen, this creates vasoplegia from all the histamines and other neuroendocrine hormones that are released. And you have a reflexive tachycardia as the patient is trying to compensate. And you know how this looks. The person comes in with hives, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. They can have airway compromised because the upper airway mucosa is getting swollen. And of course, the worst manifestation of this is when it's so severe that we get shocked. This is one of the few diseases where epinephrine is first line. Epinephrine is first line not only because it increases arterial vascular tone, but it also helps to stabilize all the other histamine release and all the other inflammatory modulators that patients have with this disease process. So remember, I am epi first, and if it doesn't fix the problem, it's time to move to IV epinephrine. And the fourth type of distributive shock is our friend septic shock. This is something that many of us see even on a daily basis. So we won't go into an in-depth review here, but the bacteria that our immune system is exposed to cause a vasoplegia of the arteries and the veins, which cause a decrease in the pipes. Now this would be fine if it was just that alone, but septic shock is interesting because sepsis itself can also cause a form of cardiogenic shock in the form of septic induced cardiomyopathy that can decrease systolic function. This is important because typically with distributive shock, when we have a decrease in our pipes, we rely on the increased cardiac output to kick in a little bit and to help compensate. But in these cases, when patients have a septic cardiomyopathy, what can happen is the person becomes vasodilated and the heart has a reduction in systolic function and can't increase to compensate. So how do you make the diagnosis? Get ultrasound at the bedside to figure out whether or not there's a component of cardiomyopathy with these patients. Because if there is, in addition to giving these patients vasopressors, we're also going to give them inotropes like we talked about with cardiogenic shock. So you got to fix the pipes, but you also have to fix the pump as well. So just as a final review, we went through the four categories of shock. We talked about hypovolemic shock, hemorrhagic and non-hemorrhagic, obstructive shock, cardiogenic shock, and distributive shock. Now, how are you gonna figure all of this out at the bedside? 
Well, it's actually quite simple. You're going to use ultrasound to make the diagnosis when it is not immediately clear about the type of shock. And in fact, even if you do know the type of shock, you should be using ultrasound anyway because it will help you to monitor the patient's response to your therapies. Now, you might be saying, well, I don't really know ultrasound. Well, I have the solution for you. Click on the link at the end of this video that'll be on the screen over here, and it'll take you to a video that explains my approach to using ultrasound in the patient with undifferentiated shock. I hope you enjoyed this review of shock on CritBits. If you like this video, please hit that like button. And if you wanna see more of our videos, hit that subscribe bell so you never miss any more videos. I'll have another video for you next Monday.